Christ tonight. Bless us. Use me, Lord, and help me in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to pray in tongues while you head to your seat. All right, Ephesians chapter 6. On Sunday nights, when we don't have any other direction, we teach on the Holy Spirit. So we're going to do that. As it is, I am currently writing uh, another book. This one's called More Than a Stained Glass Dove. The subtitle is still a work in progress. It's either uh, from Trinitarian Orthodoxy to Trinitarian Orthopraxy or How to Avoid Being a Trinitarian Theorist or Trinitarian Theory and Trinitarian Practicality, something along those lines because I want to help the body of Christ see the Holy Spirit as more than just some kind of enigma, construct, ephemeral thing. And teaching these past two or three years on Sunday nights about the Holy Spirit has helped me work out a lot of stuff I want to say in there and how to say it efficiently. Uh, That being said, we have to understand the life that we live is way more spiritual than we probably want to acknowledge. And with that statement comes this balance. We don't want to be charismatic goofy because you can get in a weird ditch And in trying to be spooky, you just end up demonized. But the other ditch is the only people that can have demons are the heretics we don't like. And I follow enough Christian blogs. These guys, bless their heart, most of them are Reformed people. They they don't believe in demons unless it's a heretic. Then he definitely has three. And I think you guys, you are so off base. So there is this balance between the, the life that we live is a very spiritual life, a very supernatural life. And it would, if we could ever see behind the curtain, we're going to look at a few verses on that tonight, probably terrify us as to how much the life we live is steered by the angelic and steered by the demonic. Probably more than we'd want to acknowledge or recognize. Uh, and, and it's one of the reasons the Lord doesn't let us see behind the curtain, but maybe once in our whole life. Maybe if you're a minister that gets really close to God in a weird place, maybe like Africa or China or you know, in the Arab countries, you might see behind the curtain 10 or 15 times in your life. If you're seeing it every week, you're weird and you probably have a demon or you're dropping methamphetamines. That's for sure. And the only people that see into the demon realm more than methamphetamines are Christian television prophets. And that's the God's honest truth right there. Stay away from those people, both the methamphetamine user, unless you've got a ministry to them, and the Christian television prophet. All right? Stay away from them. Amen. Ephesians 6, verse 11, Paul writing says, Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And we like to talk about this. There you have t-shirts, and we have bumper stickers, and uh, tattoos, put on the whole armor of God. But if we stop to consider the notion behind this, we only need armor because we have a a, a fight to fight. We have a battle to wage. Um, You know, praying grandmas like to talk about this, and we get really poetic and really, I don't know, romantic with the armor of God. But the point is not that you have a literal helmet, a literal breastplate, literal shoes, or a literal shield. The The point is that you got you got to fight to fight, and you've got to be prepared to fight it. And you hear all sorts of people talk about, I put on the armor every morning. Uh, then Pastor Vaughn would have said 25 years ago, why'd you take it off? It's not like it's hard to sleep in. Is it? It's not hard to sleep in. You're supposed to have it on right now. Do you feel anything? No. Okay, the answer is no. It's that simple. It's not real metal armor or Roman leather armor, all right? It's, it's, it's an allegory. We, we have a literal sword of the spirit. We have a literal helmet of salvation, a breastplate of righteousness. But this is, it's an allegorical application that we have a fight to fight. And that's the point of Paul's statement. And it's to stand against the wiles of the devil, which means there is one. And he has wiles that he is working against us. A wiles means traveling over trickery, methodology, strategies, deceits, crafty assaults, con, uh, cunning tactics, subtle ways. We have to have the armor of God to stand against the devil's work in our lives. Now, this is that balance because there is a demon. There is a familiar spirit that is assigned to our lives. 
We know that from the book of Job. We know that from 1 Peter. We know that from the Lord Jesus, that there is a demon that comes and he messes with your life. And doesn't, he's not a poltergeist, so there are poltergeists. I think the pathetic thing about poltergeists is that they scare Christians. And all the German means is just a noisy spirit. It's just a noisy ghost. What a lame assignment as a demon. If you're ever in a house, you know, I've t- traveled places and they want to say, this is a, we stayed at a hotel a couple weeks ago in Louisville. They said it's haunted. And uh, they, they can even give you a haunted tour of it. And I just laugh at that because I feel bad for the demon who's assigned to make things shake in a hotel. Like of all the demon assignments, you have the prince of Persia, the prince of Greece, you have Lucifer, you have demons over nations, and your retarded job is to make a window shake in a hotel in Louisville, Kentucky? What did you do to upset Satan? How did you get this demoted? And yet, you know how superstitious our stupid nation is. Oh, that's a haunted mansion. That's a haunted house. That's a haunted railway. That's a haunted coffee shop. Ooh, God have mercy if you ever have to deal with a real demon. Amen. I mean, don't be that lame. It's just like a poltergeist, a noisy ghost. Your job is to make noises and make people wet the bed in fear. The fact that that would even make you wet the bed, sit up, say, get out of here in Jesus' name. You're disturbing my sleep. Go away, you petty little thing. You Shame on you. This is all you get to do for the devil's kingdom. At least be better than that. But no. I honestly sounds like a lot of sheep. They just come in, make a lot of noise, don't ever contribute anything, and really, what's your point? Maybe we'll call them polter Christians. <laughs> for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. That's not who our battle's with, though sometimes we forget that. We want to get on social media and debate with flesh and blood. You won't ever win. But against principalities, now tell, look at who we wrestle against. This is serious stuff. We wrestle. This is literal. Armor is hyperbole. It's allegory. It's parabolic. The, the armor is nothing we can physically see, and it's not something we physically put on. It, I mean, if it is, how do you do that? You get up in the morning, grab this imaginary helmet, and, and then how do you do it? But here we understand wrestling to be literal because if you ever get into prayer, you're doing this. But listen to who it says we wrestle with. Principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. That's serious business. That means the spirit realm is more real than we probably want to acknowledge, probably more real than even the Calvinists will affirm or those who the only folks that can have demons are the heretic they disagree with doctrinally. Therefore, we take unto us the whole armor of God that we may be able to withstand in the evil day. And we need to be mindful that this realm that we're dealing with is more demonic that we are probably more steered by the demon realm than we'd like to admit, that we probably have more thoughts that take root that are fiery darts and we'd like to admit. That any area you just keep throwing yourself up against the wall and you're not getting victory over is probably some kind of principality, some kind of stronghold that has hindered you, been assigned to you. The Bible teaches, we don't have time to go in depth into it, about watchers. Watchers go back to the book of Enoch, but they're also mentioned in Genesis and most specifically in the book of Daniel. And the book of Daniel has to distinguish between watchers and a holy watcher. There are demons that just watch you. They know your weaknesses and your strengths, and they are assigned to you to hinder you, to thwart you, to tie you up, to prevent you from coming and doing what you're called to do. And most of the time, we succumb to it. One of the things we've taught you for years around here is that if you start to get addicted to excuses, they will magnify. We reject excuses. We reject excuses. If the devil sees that he can throw an excuse and you'll grab at it, he'll just keep throwing you more. And before long, you'll be so convinced. You'll have so much faith in your excuse, you'll always have the next one available. It's almost like a lifeline on a game show. Can I use a lifeline? And the devil says, I got a hundred of them for you, baby. And you'll end up going nowhere, and you'll always have a justifiable excuse. In our household, we do not allow our children to make excuses at all. We don't start with them. We're not going to finish with them. We reject excuses. Excuses are just laziness wrapped up in a lie. That's all it is. And many of those are handed to us by the demon realm. You get the sniffles on Saturday, you can't make it to church Sunday. That's an excuse. But you'll be at uh, work Monday because work pays. Serving God doesn't, you know. It is good preaching. And this is in our church. There are people who are not here tonight that were here this morning. What, did you get your punch in and don't need to be back tonight? You and I need to take inventory of the arenas of our life that we're struggling because if, if we're doing the word, 
If we're faithful to God's word, if we're walking in forgiveness, if we're paying our tithe, really the sky should be the limit. And if we're still struggling, uh, either you just have a carnal, a carnal habit set up or you've just got some kind of demonic opposition that you've got to get the victory over. Case in point is the spirit of infirmity. There, that's just the most it's the easiest to see the symptom of. And I define the spirit of infirmity. Number one, it is a demon. And what the fruit of it is, there's always somebody sick in your house. My personal conviction is if there's always someone sick in your house, or if you're just always sick, if you were to take inventory for a whole year, maybe you should do it and see how much you have symptoms and see how much you're healthy. But if you're defined by 50, 60% of your year is sick, you probably have a spirit of infirmity buffeting your family. You can get the victory over that if you want. Or you can just stay sick, and, and after this kid gets healthy, this kid gets sick. And honestly, after a while, that just becomes normal to families, and it shouldn't be normal. Amen. And so then what happens is you begin to cope. Pastor Tim, my Pastor Tim in Indy says, we're not called to cope, we're called to conquer. Amen. I don't accept sickness. I don't accept uh, coping. We want victory in our lives. We just go up. That's the spirit of faith, not coping, but conquering. So back to the spirit of infirmity, someone's always sick. And just as soon as the last kid gets healthy, mama gets sick. And the mama has to do everything, whether she's sick or healthy, because she's mama. And daddy's always sick. He's always coughing, sneezing, hacking, wheezing, limping, aching. And we all get attacked. And there are just viruses that pass through. I'm not talking about that. But when the bulk of your year is defined by sick, it probably has a spirit you've yet to do anything about. Because somewhere along the line, you maybe said, I like having the get out of jail free card. So guess what? Your heart invited a demon to your life, and you've done nothing to run it off. You've not put on the armor of God to withstand the wiles. Some people aren't sick. They just always struggle with finances. They, they make a dollar and spend nine. That could be laziness, or it could be poverty, a poverty spirit that just keeps you tread down. You can beat that with discipline. You can beat that by coming out and saying, I resist this. Ultimately, beating the devil is very simple. You submit to God... You resist the devil and he flees. That's James. James says, basically, there's demons in your life. How do we beat them? Submit to God. Resist anything the devil's selling and he'll flee. Submit to God first. Resist the devil. But as long as we're living with excuses, we'll never submit to God. We'll always embrace the devil. Just, just, let's just say that excuses are Satan's doctrine. Take inventory of how many excuses you have, and let's just, let's just view it different tonight, maybe for the going forward in your life, that when you start spewing excuses, you may be espousing demonic doctrine. The Bible teaches we're well able. Let's go up at once. Amen. We're well able. At some, <laughs> at some point, your faith needs to be like the dark night from Monty Python. <laughs> I think we're all familiar with that movie from the 70s. Monty Python and the Holy Grail, he gets an arm cut off. Come on, let's go at it. Gets the other arm cut off. Come on. Gets a leg cut off. Come on. What are you going to do, bleed on me? Come on. At some point, that's got to be our faith. Some of us were so lame, we lift the sword. Oh, my bicep hurts. I can't make it to church tonight. Oh, <clears throat> I sneezed in my helmet. I, I don't think I can be there for evangelism ever. You've got to give props to the, the dark night, or the, uh, and the black night. I'm invincible. He's laying there a bloody nub. I'll bite your ankles. <laughs> now I sound like those secret churches had the summer at the movies. Forgive me for stooping to that level of stupidity. But I just think we, we have to, Pastor John Osteen used to say, even if the world beats you down to a greasy pulp, you're still a greasy pulp saying, you will not win. You will not win. You will not win. Take inventory of your lame excuses because that's demonic doctrine. It's demonic propaganda, and you believed it. You believed you weren't able. So the demon succeeded in that vain imagination. And the horrific thing about excuses is that you teach them to your children. And you take no as an answer. And you accept it. Rather than saying, what about now, Lord? What about now? We have to be like Jacob who says, I will not let go of you till you bless me. I will not quit, Lord, until you bless me. We have to be willing to fight for these things. And many of us, because we're honestly just lazy, the upper Cumberland is lazy, we just, we're happy to take a hold of any excuse that gets us out of 
hard work and exertion and responsibility. And people like that, uh, Genesis 6 says, the Lord, he said, his spirit won't always strive with those people. He will step over them and move on. And you'll be left behind. You'll be part of the generation that gets to die blessed in the wilderness. Blessed, yes, but dead. Not inheriting the promises. You may not even get to see your kids inherit them either. So let's keep reading here. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth, not excuses. Having on the breastplate of righteousness, not condemnation. Your feet shod with the procrastination of the gospel of peace. Somebody said... uh, I haven't even begun to procrastinate. (laughs) Preparation, that means you're already ready. Above all, taking the shield of faith. Let me ask you this, or let me also say this, kind of twofold. If God were to ask you to do something tonight, would you be ready at a moment's notice, or would you be terrified of what it was? If God were to call you up tonight and say, I need you to do this, could you do it sun up tomorrow? Or would your heart automatically be populating a list as to why you can't? And maybe the reason you've never heard the Lord ask you is because you already demonstrated years ago that you'll never be ready. You'll never obey. And he doesn't waste time. He's just not going to waste his time. I would also say that even as a pastor, there are people I would never call upon at 2 a.m. Because they're not going to be there for me. Now, I get called upon at 2 a.m. because they expect me to be there for them. But there are certain people you just don't call upon because they've demonstrated through a lifestyle of excuses. They're not a trustworthy gas pedal. And you and I need to be that gas pedal that if God stomps on it, we give him instant horsepower. I've told you about my first vehicle, an 84 Bronco 2. And I learned about carbureted engines with that car because if I tried to step on it too hard, I'd stall it. And you only have to do that three or four times in busy Seattle traffic to realize the sweet spot is halfway between full, express, uh, full, uh, full extension and full depression. If I try to cut out in traffic, you even start to time cars. If that car is closer than 100 yards, there's no sense in even trying to pull out. My car is going to stall. That becomes a car you can't trust. Faithful, but I could never get the full horsepower out of the truck. Loved it. It was good looking like a lot of you, but not dependable. Like people I know. We need to be the trustworthy engine that if God stomps on, we have instant horsepower all torque to the wheels, nothing choking, nothing dying, nothing drowning out, smelling like gasoline, and trying to start over while cars are slamming on the brakes, honking at us, cussing us. Because you do that too many times, and you're just going to sell the car because it's a lemon and move on to something better. What's the last thing God commanded you to do that you stalled out on? What's the last time God stomped on you, expected instant horsepower, and you went, whoa, 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 Lord. And he said, ba, 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 I'm moving to someone else. We can't be that way. We have to be who God has called us to be. If you're born again, you can handle it. Our feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Pastor Darren, one of the pastors I served for many years, he was doing a lot of missions when I served him in Knoxville 25 years ago. And he kept his life. He had four children. He still has them. They're just all grown with kids now. Um, he, he and Miss Shelley lived a life that if God told them to move to the mission field, they could be there in less than six months. They lived ready to deploy. And honestly, some of us can't even deploy on a Sunday night to service. And your heart has to be willing to deploy anywhere in the world in a moment's notice and make no excuses or say, Lord, I can't. Your, Lord, your word has to say, Lord, if you call me to do it, help me. I'll do it. You just have to help me because we're well able. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith we shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Now, talking about this demon realm. Go with me to 2 Kings. And let's just talk a little bit behind the spirit realm and then we'll see what else we want to say. 2 Kings chapter 6, because the spirit realm is more real than the natural realm. 
Um, you know, Miss Danielle's amening me over here. We know her testimony. She testified, uh, manufactured methamphetamines. And she didn't just manufacture, she also used her product. She believed in her product so much, she used it. So when I got to know her, knowing she was spirit-filled, I said, let me ask you some questions. You did drugs for a long time. Tell me about some of your experiences in the spirit realm. And boy, did I get an earful. And I said, I, 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 I thought as much. Probably not this much, but I thought as much. And I'm not encouraging anybody to do drugs to experience the spirit realm, because we may never get you back. But anybody who's ever done drugs can tell you they've seen things that absolutely terrify them. And they would also tell you that there's probably more uh, traffic going on in the spirit realm, spirit realm than you'll ever understand. I was in Key West, Florida several times in the 90s doing ministry. And I had a vision one time in prayer of Key West and I saw it from the coast. And Key West is a very sinful island. It's about two miles wide by seven miles long, very tiny island, old extinct coral reef. The Florida Keys are all, it's basically a giant atoll where the seawater has receded in times past. Uh, don't let them lie to you about climate change. The fact that it was once a coral reef, all the keys, means at some point the ocean was a lot deeper. But the fact that we have cities up and down that coral reef lets you know the water has receded a long time ago. And so what if it's coming back now? It was once all underwater anyway. That's what made it a coral reef. That aside, uh, when we study geology, we study in terms of uh, longer than 60 years of meteorological record keeping. So I see Key West and I see this dark storm cloud over the island and I thought, well, that's interesting. It tapered out over the coast, but thicker in the middle. And then in the vision, I moved closer into it and I saw that the, the, the cloud, this dark cloud wasn't like a storm cloud. It was the density of demons over the, over the island. And it was thinner on the outside. Of course, there's nobody out there. But there in the middle of the island was this thick cloud of, of entities, demonic entities. That's a terrifying concept. And then to know that the Lord said, I want you to go spend a month there this summer and help the assemblies of God learn things. All right. Well, at least I know what I'm getting myself into. Second Kings chapter six. This is the story of Elisha and his new servant. And the king of Syria warring against Israel and they're trying to encompass Israel, but everywhere they go, the Israelites seem to know the Syrian movement. Verse 11, Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing. And he called his servants and said unto them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? Which one of you is the mole, giving the king of Israel our location and movements? Verse 12, And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet that is in Israel, he tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedchamber. That's the true gift of a prophet's office. And he said, Go and spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host. And they came by night and compassed the city about. Now that's got to be terrifying. You're just a little prophet, and you're hiding out in Dothan, and now somebody's narked on you, and now you have a whole platoon of soldiers that have surrounded this little city of Dothan. Verse 15, And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, a host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots, all for one little man, Elisha. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? Look at all these enemy chariots, the Syrians. And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Well, what do you mean? Because nobody knows we're here. We're just two little Israelites hanging out in Dothan. And they're looking at natural armies, chariots of the Assyrians, they know they're in trouble because they're the reason the king of Israel keeps winning. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to benefit the king of Syria to kill Elisha. And Elisha knows that. And the servant knows that. He knows it's dangerous to run with the man of God. And Elisha prayed, verse 17, and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man. Now this is a gift of the Spirit called discerning of spirits. And he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire, 
round about Elisha, not round about Dothan, not round about the servant, around the man of God. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite this people, I pray, with blindness. And he smote them with the blindness according to the word of Elisha. Elisha was not moved because he knew that there was an angelic army around him. And if we could ever understand there's, uh, like he said, more are they that are for us than they that are against us. If we could ever have that confidence in the spirit realm. One of the points I want to show you is that there's always more going on in the spirit realm than you understand. Always more. Now, the ditch we don't want to get in is the goofy charismatic where every bump in the night is a demon. It's not the case. At the same time, if you're constantly a jerk to your spouse, you may have a demon. I want to be clear on that. You may have a spirit of agitation that just shoots you with fiery darts and lights you up like a flaming porcupine, which is why you're a jerk. There's no reason to always be angry and stressful and tense and agitated at the, the covenant partner called your spouse. If you're always irritated with your kids, what's wrong with you? But everything that goes bumps in the night just because your car breaks down doesn't mean there's a demon in the engine. They're not really interested in your engine. They're interested in your soul. So let's begin with where you're agitated and always weird. And, and figure out if you could just submit to God, do the word, you could probably straighten out a lot of that goofiness. I, I, I want to show you there's more going on in the spirit realm than we realize. And I'm all for treating everything in the natural. Treat it as much in the natural as you can. Pray at the same time. Pray, pray for your engine and cast the, the goblins out if you need to. And I get it. There are the miracles that can be performed. You're in the middle of nowhere. Got to get to a prayer meeting. You're out of gas and the battery's dead. Lay hands because you got no other option. Call AAA on the satellite phone, but lay hands too. Maybe God will come through for you before the AAA does. Do everything you can to keep on moving, but don't get in a ditch on one side or the other. You need to know there's more going on than just you being lazy, though your laziness may draw a lot of attention to the demon realm. There is a place to get such a momentum going, nothing stops you. And excuses drop anchors very quickly. And unfortunately, this region and some of you, you are defined by your excuses. That is your gospel, your excuses. I can't. Well, we're busy. You are not busy. You're lazy. You're lazy with your time, which deceives you into thinking you're busy. You're not busy. You're just horrible with your time management. Fix your time management. Budget that too. We have as many hours in the day. We're all equal. There's your great equity. We have as many hours in the day. We all have 24. We just all use them differently. You just happen to squander yours and use that as an excuse why you can't do more for God. Well, we're just so busy. You control your time clock. So that's your fault. And God's calling you to do more. And he knows how many hours he's given you. And he's not unjust to give you more than you have hours to do. You just got to do better with your time. Amen. Go to Daniel 10. Let's look at some things behind the curtain there. Daniel chapter 10. Daniel 10. I'm trying to think of any stories. I just have to give them to you as the Lord reminds me of them. Um, we believe in angels. We believe they help minister. We believe they help protect us. I believe that they're in here right now. We can't see them because if we could, it would weird us all out. Um, I believe there's twice as many angels as there are demons because a third of the demons fell or angels fell. So that means we got two thirds as many left helping us. We don't always know what they do. They protect us. There's warring angels. There's protecting angels, messenger angels. I'm thankful to have any kind of angel we can have. And many of you have testimonies of them preserving your life and you even seeing them in the act. We had Sarah Ogilvie share how years ago when she was pregnant with Libby, Libby who is now in medical school at Baylor, so that's 20 something years ago, she saw a giant angel sitting on the guardrail, put its foot out and kick her car away so that it, she didn't have an accident and it didn't even damage her car. That's pretty fantastic. An angel kick your car and not kick the quarter panel in. And not because it was a solid metal Cadillac or some rust bucket called a Chevy GMC, because those things are rust buckets. That's gospel truth right there. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Cephas. Uh, we believe they, uh, they help us. I, I've told you I was in a car accident probably 13 or 14 years ago. We were in North Carolina, and um, I had my sunglasses on my head like this, and the guest host pastor had given us all a box of little chocolates. It felt like Forrest Gump. And I'm sitting there looking at these chocolates, 
and um, I have them in my hand. And I look up just in time to see this minivan pull out in front of us. And we're doing, we're doing 65 on 70 or 70. It's a four-way divided. And I look up and I say, guys, guys. And I say, oh, Jesus, help us. And I look up just in time for us to slam on the brakes and still hit her at about 55 miles an hour, just T-bone her. And when I did that, my hands went up to protect my face. And then, I, of course, I closed my eyes. And uh, we hit the car. And then when we stopped... My sunglasses were in the dash, the airbag had deployed, but my box of chocolates was still in my hand and my hand was still in my lap and all the chocolates were there, which meant it wasn't my arms I saw go up. And I remember going, whoa, those were not my arms because I would have thrown those chocolates, you know. <laughs> the chocolates were still in the box, in my lap, in my hand, my hands were still where they were, but somebody else's arms came up and protected my face from the airbag. And, I, and then uh, Scott Dondano was behind me. Josh Barkley was behind me. And then the driver was one of the pastor's guys. Dondano didn't even have his seatbelt on. He was fine. Everybody was fine. We walked out, and I remember getting out of the car going, I am indestructible. <laughs> as long as I'm in the will of God, I'm unkillable. And I have to shut up. That's not wise to think. But something went up to protect my face and my chocolates. And I remember grabbing my my sunglasses and putting them back on, made sure everybody was okay. There's so much more going on. And we, we want to be in tune to it. We don't worship angels. We're not terrified of demons. And we certainly don't show honor to excuses. We probably, like we used to have the confession police back in the Word of Faith movement, where we'd say, don't say that, don't confess that. We probably need to bring the excuse police back in. And maybe just have some kind of buzzer. Nah, lame. Meh, sounds like an excuse to me. Meh, sounds like God don't like you. Meh, sounds like you want to go nowhere for Jesus. I think if we started, or maybe some of you, because I could call you by name, we just install an excuse shock collar on you. <laughs> and once you wet your britches seven or eight times, you'll just stop talking altogether, and God could do something with your life. Because you don't realize how much you're squeezed and just excuses. And then you don't just make excuses for you, you make excuses for your kids. And you've taught them to make excuses. And it really hinders your progression in Christ. And those excuses are taught you by the demon realm. Uh, because when you serve God, you just don't make excuses. You say, Lord, I don't know how you're going to work it, but we're going we're to work it, so show me what to do. Daniel 10. Daniel is in prayer. Verse 7, I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them, so they fled to hide themselves. Therefore, I was left alone and saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned in me into corruption, and I retained no strength. Yet heard I the voice of his words, and when I heard the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep on my face, and my face toward the ground. And behold, a hand touched me that set me upon, the palms, uh, upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. And he said unto me, verse 11, Daniel 10, 11, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee and understand and stand upright. For unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken these words unto me, I stood trembling. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words." This is interesting because it shows us that angels are dispatched for our prayers. If we didn't have this passage, we couldn't build that doctrine. But that's what the text says. We take it at face value. There's no other mystical interpretation. Let's read verse 12 again. Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you did set your heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard. So think about this three-point formula here. Daniel set him his heart to understand. Lord, I want to understand. In this case, the setting is, why are we still imprisoned in Persia? Why hasn't Jeremiah's prophecies come to pass yet? Why isn't this working? Which would be a good application for all of us. Why is my family still suffering? Why don't my kids serve you? Why are we sick all the time? Why can't we get a leg up in life? These are the promises of God for us. We're not in Persian slavery, but we might be in slavery to the world when we shouldn't be. 
Maybe, like, like Reverend Danny taught us last week, maybe our eyes aren't wet enough. Maybe our eyes are too dry and we have not interceded and pressed into the presence of God deep enough to get the answer. Maybe we don't because we're terrified of the answer. Maybe we already intuitively know the answer and we don't want to hear it. Either way, step one, we can make a three-point sermon out of this. You have to set your heart to understand why things aren't working according to the Word of God. If God's promises are not happening in our life, it's not God's fault. It's ours. It's our fault. God is true. We're the short circuit. God is the nuclear power plant running power. We're the fuse box. If our house is dark, we've blown fuses. His power never fades. It never waffles. The, the generator never goes down. He's an infinite source of all power. Verse point two would say was the next point, and to chasten thyself before thy God. What's the modern translation say there? What's that? Humble yourself. Oh, now we're sounding like chronicles. If my people that are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. So humility, that means, Lord, where am I wrong? Lord, what have we done? Why are we still in captivity? Jeremiah said 70 years. We're past that. What's going on here? Lord, your word says healing. Your word says provision. Your word says salvation for my household. Your word says that my offspring will serve you. We're not seeing that, Lord. What, where is this my fault? When you start asking for where it's your fault, you automatically begin to diffuse excuses. Humility diffuses excuses. The propagation of excuses is the voice of pride. I can't. You don't. Anytime you say you don't understand, you extinguish all possible help in your life. You don't understand. You just, you just don't understand. I've tried so hard. It's just so difficult. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Just shut your mouth. Let God be true and let every one of us be the liar. Humble yourself. And thy words were heard, which means now there's something going forth out of their mouth. Prayer is not mental. You cannot pray in your head. That's called thinking. Words were heard, not thoughts. Christians have been taught a monstrous sack of lies called you can pray quietly. You can pray under your breath, sure, but you can't pray without words. The words in the Hebrew and Greek for prayer is an oration. It means it has to be spoken. Jesus said, speak to mountains. You don't think to them, but your words were heard. Imagine Daniel, an Old Testament prophet, not even have the Holy Ghost or salvation like us, was praying and moving nations and his words were heard. But angels hear our words today too, but maybe we give them nothing to work with. We give them nothing to come for because they're all excuses. It's so hard. You don't get it. It's so tough. I was brought up this way. I've been hurt so bad. You just don't understand. It's really, you don't understand how that hurt me. You don't understand what that did to me. Excuses. That's like spiritual diarrhea. Don't make, don't just, just, just apologize. Don't justify it. Just say, I, I, I blew my pants out again. At some point, you get the bug out of your system. Five-minute, five-pound diet, it blows out. Your skin near, you feel better, don't do it again. Whatever you ate, don't eat it again. Quit making excuses. Definitely don't make them for your kids. You're going to curse them. Now, picking back up, I have come for your words. That should encourage us to pray more. But here's something behind the scenes now. Verse 13. I was come for your words, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. Now, here is an interesting spiritual insight. I was dispatched 21 days ago for your prayer, but I was stopped by a demon. The prince of Persia. The prince of the kingdom doesn't mean a man. We're not talking about prince of the Medes or the Persians. We're talking about a demon, a principality, a giant majestic demon over a whole empire. And he was able to hinder this angel. That's profound to think about. And there's no evidence that this side of the cross, demons still don't hinder de angels. There's nothing that says the new birth prevented demonic spiritual warfare. If the blood of Christ eliminated all spiritual warfare, why did we just read Ephesians 6 and talk about taking upon us the armor of God? and wrestling, wrestling. If anybody should have total victory over demons, it should be us. And yet we're told we will wrestle with principalities. So he begins to pray and an angel's dispatched for those words. However that works, I don't know, but they're dispatched for our words. We know our words and our prayers are stored up in heaven as incense. And yet a demon hinders this mighty angel for 21 days. How powerful is that demon? 
that an angel fresh from the throne of God is hung up. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. Now that's Michael the archangel. He's the prince of the people of Israel. So whatever this massive Persian demon is, this other angel has to have help from Michael. So now it's a two-man job. That's a mighty demon. I just want to give you insights to the spirit realm and also to encourage you not to give up in prayer. Because what's at stake here Think about, I just want you to see the criticality of what's at stake, and even it has to be contended for in prayer. What's at stake is the commonwealth of the Israeli people. What's at stake is the fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecy. What's at stake is the remnant returning to Israel and reestablishing a second temple and preparing a way for the coming Messiah. What's at stake you would think would be sovereignly unfolding without any hindrance. And yet what's at stake, what's been prophesied, what's been promised still has to be interceded for. And then it is still resisted by demons and it still takes Michael the archangel coming and tag teaming with a lesser angel to even make prayers answered. That's what's at stake. The future lineage and political setup for the Messiah. And we pray, what, 10 minutes a day? Wonder why our family don't serve God? We pray and read our Bible maybe 30 minutes a day if we're really ripping it up. And we're wondering why we have little fruit. It's because we do little cultivation. These things must be contended for. Your faith must go deep. Your prayer life must go deep. Your Bible study must go deep. You must have a fervent walk with God for yourself. You must teach your children how to walk with God for themselves. You must teach them to hate excuses and tell them that, no, you can do anything if you'll just shut your mouth and do it. Get out there and do it. You must hate excuses in your household because they mock God. We either have a faith that says we can do it, let's go up at once, or you're going to be of the 10 spies that curse the land and are just left to die. You have to press into God. This thing is so critical that you walk with God for yourself. What is profound is Daniel's all alone in this intercession. He doesn't have a prayer team. One man is the linchpin to fulfilling Jeremiah's prophecy and ushering in Christ. One man. And thank God he didn't give up after 18 days, 19 days, 20 days. And all of a sudden an angel shows up and says, sorry, I'm late. I've been coming here for a long time. You're highly favored of God. They love you up there. But listen to me. Here's my excuse. (laughs) Prince of Persia. That's all I have to say. That's a justifiable excuse. When you have a demon that wrestles with you for 21 days, we will take that excuse. All right. We can trust the angel because he's not a human with an ego and insecurity and wanting to lie. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, but lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia, which means there were a lot of demons there. Now I've come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days. He's coming to answer the prayer. What's happened to our people, God? What's happened to our, our people, God? For 21 days, he's interceding and asking, why haven't we seen the promises? And God dispatches an angel to tell him exactly what's going to happen. Now, it doesn't stop there. Let's jump down. Verse 18, then there came again and touched me one like the appearance of a man and he strengthened me. This is the same angel. He said, O man, greatly beloved, fear not. Peace be unto thee. Be strong. Yes, be strong. And when he had spoken uh, unto me, I was strengthened and said, let my Lord speak for thou hast strengthened me. Then he said, knowest thou why I've come unto thee? And now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia? Now you got to give it to these angels. That means I got a fight coming to see you and I got a fight getting out of here. Now this is foreign to my mind, even to this day to think we have angelic angels assigned to us, but they can even be resisted by demons. We just think they just walk through demons, I guess, like Jesus does crowds. But this tells us When I leave, I'm going to have to fight with the prince of Persia again. This is a part of angelology that is, it's spooky. The fact that demons can hinder angels and angels have to fight with demons. It's just, it's in the word. This is a small window. We can't go beyond what we see, but he says, let's take him at his word. Now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia? I'm going to leave you. have delivered a message to you. And now while I leave, I'm going to fight the prince of Persia. Now there's a bigger theological doctrine that basically says this. 
when nations and empires rise and fall, their principalities have to rise and fall too. Now, the Persians are about to fall. The Medo-Persian Empire is about to fall and give way to the Macedonians. And for the Macedonians to come on the scene, the Persian principality has to fall. And that may be, this is, this is a theology that's old school and we don't hear much about it because we're too busy having our blessed day ever and getting our blessing on and every day of Friday, all that malarkey that makes us narcissistic and self-entitled. We don't understand theology anymore. But the old theology says the prince of Greece is about to come. That establishes the Macedonian Empire, Alexander the Great. But in order for the Macedonians to uh, eradicate the Persians, the Persian principality has to be cast down. So when nations rise and fall, let me help you. It's not about colonialism. There's a spiritual battle going on behind the scenes. God's hand is for people. God's hand is against people. The Greeks coming on the scene is prophesied, which means God wanted it, which means he's going to eradicate the Persians. And for certain nations and cultures to fall four and 500 years ago, God used the colonials to eradicate them. And it's not a color thing unless you're a shallow, ignorant human being. It's a spiritual thing. Amen. He says, I'm going to fight with the prince of Persia, and when I'm gone forth, lo, the prince of Greece shall come. What's interesting is right after this, the Persian Empire falls and the Greek Empire explodes. The Greek Empire runs for another 350 years till the Romans supersede the Greeks. But notice there's also a prince of Greece. I'm leaving. I'm going to deal with the prince of Persia, and the prince of Greece will take his place. And that becomes, uh, actually, we'll keep reading because it, it goes on to confirm this. I will show thee what is noted in the scripture of truth, that there is none that holdeth with me in these things but Michael, your prince. 11.1, uh, also in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood to confirm and to strengthen him. And now will I show thee the truth. So this is the angel speaking. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the four shall be far richer than they all. And by this strength through the riches, he shall stir up against all against the realm of Grecia. And a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven and not to his posterity nor according to his dominion, which he ruled. Um, for his kingdom shall be plucked up even for others beside those. That came to pass. That is the destruction of the Medo-Persian Empire. Then Alexander the Great becomes king. He takes over the Greek Empire. The Macedonian Empire explodes. Uh, Alexander the Great dies at about 31, 32 years old under mysterious circumstances. And his children don't take his place. It's divided among four, uh, and the Greek word escapes me now, basically four leaders. And they take the, the Greek Empire and divide it into four corners. And Daniel prophesied it before it happened. That's all cool, but behind the scenes you see a Persian, excuse me, you see a spiritual battle. My point tonight is there's more going on behind the scenes than meets the eye. And we feed it when we make excuses. We feed it when we don't pray. We feed it when we don't confess the word. We feed it when we just let things be willy-nilly in our life. We have to be like Daniel and ask the question, why don't we see the promises in the word? Why are my children always sick? Some of you, your children are always sick. Please listen to me. That is a spirit of infirmity. I love your children. I know you love your children, but have you prayed two and three hours a night to break that spirit off your household? When it's always one sickness, one sickness, one sickness, one sickness, one sickness. Well, you know, it's just germs. Well, by God, blessed by now, they ought to have the most ironclad immune system. I mean, if they're out there licking dirt and licking fence posts and eating chicken poop, they ought to be just as stout as a Viking. I know they're just sick again, just sick again, just sick again, just sick again, just sick again. When will you stand for something? When will you resist it? When will you fight against it? When will you labor in prayer till things turn? Because we don't just have angels working for us. We have the authority of the believer. We have the power to cast out devils. We have the power to stand. Years ago, when Lydia was a baby, she had a sickness on her, and I was so angry. Man, and I prayed every night for one to two hours, every night for two or three months. And after about six weeks of us praying, healing over our baby, because Lydia was just about two months old, about the sixth week of us praying, one to two hours every night, fervent prayer, because I was mad as a new daddy. The Lord showed me, he said, this is a spirit of infirmity. Well, praise God. 
I know something else to shoot at now. So then from that point forward, for the next month or two, every night we prayed, we would pray the healing scriptures, and I would say, and I rebuke that spirit of infirmity in Jesus' name. We submit to God. We resist you. You can go to hell. Next verse, honey. She'd read the verse. I'd pray it. I'd read the verse. She'd pray it. And we would attack that spirit of infirmity. After about another five weeks, I knew in prayer that spirit of infirmity was gone. Hallelujah. We go in there, she still has symptoms. We keep praying. Two or three weeks after that, we go in there one morning to check on her. Every symptom is gone. But what if I quit after a month? What if I quit after two months? We quit so easily and we roll over and cope because we have middle-class prosperity. We cope because we have microwaves. We cope because we have the internet. We cope because we drive nice cars. We cope because we have... Walmart pre-order pickup. We cope because we have other things to do than actually spend two hours a night in prayer to change our children. We cope and we hand our kids a lesser destiny. Our laziness magnifies it in their life. You've got to be willing to hone in on something that's not right in your life, something that's out of line with the word of God and pray about it till God shows you like the angel. I've come to show you your answer. And then once you have the answer, now it's time to change gears and attack it in a different way. He prayed and prayed and prayed. Why are we here? The angel shows him. Then he changes how he prays. What if the Lord shows me that's a spirit of infirmity? And that's, that, oh, wow, it's a spirit of infirmity. Now, no, now we've got to figure out how we're going to pray against that. Once the spirit of infirmity is gone, we still have symptoms because he left his imprint. I've got to change so that thing is totally fixed and made right. We quit too easily, church because we're Americans and life is easy. And really, the prosperity of God in our nation has undermined our faith. We've got to get back to a fervency that intercedes till things change. We pray till things change, but we'll only pray when it's important to us. Do not be like Hezekiah, who God, he repented because his life was on the line. You're a dead man. Set your house in order. Hezekiah repents. Isaiah the prophet says, you have 15 more years. You shall not see the judgment of God in your day, but the, your sons shall see it. And Hezekiah says, rejoice. The word of God is good. I shall not see judgment. What a selfish moron. He interceded to get pressure off of him, but dumped it on his children. Why not intercede a little bit longer to see how much we can postpone the judgment of God? I don't want my kids to see the judgment. How can I prepare them to weather that? How can I instill in them this faith that can repent so quickly? Why was Hezekiah so powerful to repent for his sin, but dumped all the judgment and destruction on his offspring? That's not good parenting. It's a selfish man. There's more going on behind the realm than meets the eye. And let me show you one or two more verses here. Let's go to Job. Job 2. I was going to talk about the five ways we mistreat the Holy Spirit, but that won't fit tonight. Job chapter 2. I'm sorry, Job 1. Verse 6, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them, the accuser of the brethren, the adversary. And the Lord said unto Satan, Where have you come from? And Satan answered the Lord, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. This is a verse or a passage that helps us build the understanding that the familiar spirits, they evaluate our lives and they evaluate what we do. By the time you're 12 or 13 or 14, usually by the time you're 16 or 17, you've already pretty much pioneered your sins. That's pretty much where you're going to trip up the rest of your life. And now unless you just go way off the deep end and embrace that sin, you're not going to pioneer too much more. And the devil knows this. He has evaluated your life, and he's helped present things to you to see what you're going to bite on. So as it is in our mature age, he knows our weaknesses. There's things the devil never tempts me with because he knows I just laugh at it. Then there's other things that has worked in my life or been a temptation in my life since I was a teenage boy. Ego, pride, uh, there's always the lust of the flesh, 
And those things you just have to keep tabs on and just keep putting them down. He knows these things because he watches us and he's a student and he has nothing else to do. And that, that helps us understand why there's seasons when we just absolutely dominate in life. And there's seasons where all of a sudden everything we thought we got the victory over flare up like the worst case of gout or bunions or sickness than we've ever had. Why all of a sudden am I struggling with this? This is your visitation. This demon has made his circuit. He's walking to and fro, up and down it, and it's his time to come visit your house again because he hadn't seen you in a few weeks. And he comes with everything that worked on you last time to see, have you strengthened yourself against this or have you just been la living, uh, living lazily? And, and he's going to see it. So Job 1, verse 7, the Lord said, Satan, where have you come from? Walking to and fro, walking up and down it. And the Lord said unto Satan, hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that fears God and eschews evil. Then Satan answers the Lord and says, does Job fear God for nothing? Now, Satan's asking an honest question, does it? He fears you. He fears you for a good reason. He fears you because you have, has you not made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he has on every side? This shows us a working of the spirit realm. Satan has obviously seen Job. Satan knows who Job is. Satan doesn't say, who's Job? Satan gives a report back to God. Yes, Job fears you. He, you've put a hedge about everything he has. Why would Satan know that? Because he's investigated it. He's made his perimeter walk. He, he's somebody he has visited. He doesn't have to ask, oh no, who's Job? Can you point me his direction? Satan is very familiar with Job, just like he's familiar with every one of us. And we see in the spirit realm, there's a concept called hedges of protection. And look at what Satan says, because he's not lying, otherwise he'd be rebuked. You've put a hedge about him, you've put a hedge about his house, and you've put a hedge about all that he has on every side. That's something Satan could see in the spirit realm. And Satan goes on to say, and I love it when the devil can give us doctrine. He's kind of telling off on how this thing works. And you've blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. Satan knows all this about Job because Satan is a watcher. And he's obviously tried to do something to Job in the past, but could not get through those hedges. He's tried to spoil his increase, but could not have access to it, which tells us that if Job can have it, so can we. Which brings us back to we should ask ourselves, why do we suffer loss so much? Why are our kids weird? Why are they always sick? Why don't we prosper? Where's the hedge broken? That's why we say that. Where's the hedge broken? God can bless our hand, the work of our hands and the increase of everything in the land. But God, uh, Satan says to God in verse 11, put forth thine hand now and touch all that he has and he will curse thee to your face. And the Lord said unto Satan, behold, all that he has is in your power. God is not the one that brings destruction. God is not the one that, that does this to people. He gives Satan authority over Job. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Now, he's gone forth with the authority to touch everything Job has but Job. So we see that. Satan, we're talking about behind the scenes here. Satan has the authority to touch everything behind the scenes but Job, which basically means the hedge around Job's possessions has been removed, the hedge around Job's house has been renewed, removed, the, the hedge around Job's uh, businesses have been removed, but the hedge still remains around Job. All right, we with me? Okay, because we're about to see how Satan moves in the earth. Verse 13, and there was a day, doesn't say it was the next day, just a day, when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house, and there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing, and the asses feeding beside them, and the Sabians fell upon them and took them away. Yes, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. So the devil uses a group of people to bring destruction to Job's household, his servants, and his livestock. Satan leaves. The next thing that happens is Sabians are stirred up to destroy. It's a devourer. It's demonic. It looks like just a random bandit attack, but it's demonic. So please see that. The devil uses people 
to destroy God's people. Verse 16, while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, the fire of God, it just means a great fire, the fire of God has fallen from heaven, hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I am only am escaped alone to tell thee. Uh, so now it's a supernatural fire, but God's not in this fire. The Hebrew just says the fire of the Almighty, the fire of the mighty. So now a supernatural fire, but that's demonic too. And it killed something that no longer had a hedge. Verse 17, while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, the Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away. Yes, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped to tell thee. When now the devil is moving upon a group, another group of people, the Chaldeans, Sabians, fire Chaldeans. Verse 18, while he was yet speaking, there came also another saying, thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house and it fell upon the young men and they are dead and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. We have a supernatural fire, supernatural wind and it's not God, it's demonic. That's why we don't chase wind and fire. Then Job arose, rent his mantle, shaved his head, fell down upon the ground and worship and said, naked came I out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Famous song, horrible doctrine. Satan did all this. But Job doesn't know that because he can't see into the demon realm. But Job's book records it post-fact. Who just did all this? Satan. So Job ignorantly says God has moved and taken this away. But we just see it's the Sabians, it's the Chaldeans, it's a supernatural wind and a supernatural fire. And remember from 1 Kings 19, Elijah's on the mountain of God. There's an there's a earthquake. God's not in the earthquake. There's a Whirlwind, God's not in the whirlwind. There's a fire, God's not in the fire. Same thing here. But behind the scenes, Satan has been authorized because the covenant is broken. The hedge is broken and he has access to Job. This is, this is to say there's more going on behind the scenes than we ever realize. And we've been given the word of God to stand against all of it to pray, to make intercession, to say, Lord, I still trust you. Show me what's going on. Lord, I still trust you. Show me what's going on. Lord, I still trust you. Show me what's going on. Lord, I still trust you. Show me what's going on. There's always more going on than meets the eye, but are we willing to get into prayer till, till an angel, till the Lord shows us what that thing is? We're not just to be tossed and driven with every wind. We have the ability to move through life be victorious. We will have opposition. We will get wet. We might even get seasick in the storms of life, but we have the power of God to go to the other side. But are we willing to pray to make intercession to these things change? There's, there's more that are with us and that are against us. There's more angels than there are demons. We have the authority. If the Old Testament saints can pull it out when all looks lost, we have more power, more authority, more dominion to pull it out if we're willing to press in and seek our God. But really, our greatest weakness as Americans is we are just so incredibly lazy. We're so incredibly distracted. We think, I'll pray tomorrow. And when you do that for six months, you've wasted six months of intercessory time that could have been changing your life for the glory of God. The American church just doesn't even get it anymore. I was listening, I listened to a pod, I listened to a couple things. I listened to a lot of stuff. I was listening to a podcast this week. It's a Christian podcast, and it's kind of, they discuss news, but I like the second half of the podcast because one of the guys brings on theologians, and they discuss all sorts of very high-level intellectual theology, which tickles my fancy, and it stretches me in areas. But the first part of the podcast, they were talking about the current election cycle and everything that's going wrong, and they, these podcasters kind of tend a little bit more to the progressive side of Christianity and they hate both sides of the aisle. They, they point out that at the RNC, the Republican National Convention, they were raffling AR-15s, which kill people. And they did it for political theater. And I was like, oh, yeah, it is political theater. And then they said, and the DNC was giving away free abortions at their Democratic National Convention that takes lives. And they were doing it for political theater. So both sides care nothing about life. I'm like, that's a fair assessment. Ain't all guns or something like any good AR-15 owner is not going in the backyard shooting their neighbor. But, you know, Planned Parenthood exists to kill black people. Funded by the Democrats. 
number one killer of blacks in America is Planned Parenthood. And nobody seems to care about that. Now, there are great people that do, but that's why Planned Parenthoods always pop up in black communities. I would be so offended at that. If I was black, I would be so hot at that. I would be so angry. Anyway, but they were asking this one lady, she's a theologian, she's actually at Duke getting her PhD in something theological, and she said, I'm hopeful. And they asked her, why are you so hopeful for our nation? She said, because I believe in the Holy Spirit. And my heart said, so what does that even mean to you? And they asked her the same thing, what does that even mean? And this is the condition of the American church. This is, she's going to be a theologian with a PhD or a THD from Duke, very highfalutin. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Great. What does that even mean? Even the demons fear and tremble. What does it mean to believe in the Holy Spirit? We've been given the Holy Spirit as a co-laborer. We co-work together with him. He works together with us to pray, to make intercession, to make changes in our own lives, to be led by the Holy Ghost in prayer, to pray as he leads us so that the kingdom of God would come and things would be different than they are. But as it is in our nation, we have made the church just a giant spectatorship. And then we want a prayer line in Pentecostal circles that fixes my laziness. And prayer circles, prayer lines don't fix your laziness. They give you an energy boost so you can go do something about it yourself. If prayer lines had fixed stuff, we wouldn't still be messed up. So you and I, our assignment is to dig out the wells of prayer again. Dig out the wells of Bible study. Get after God for yourself. You have to know God for yourself. You have to know prayer for yourself. You have to know intercession for yourself. You have to know how to tithe and give offerings for yourself. You've got to know God for yourself. Gone are the days where the pastor can carry you. Gone are the days where the ministry gifts can carry you. Gone are the days where the church can carry you. We can't just be a hospital of sick caring for each other. We have to be better. We can't stay sick anymore. We've got to come up. There's so much more going on behind the scenes. You don't have the liberty, the permission to be carnal anymore. Be, be spiritual. Be people of prayer. Ask God where you make excuses. Ask God where you're lazy. Ask God where your doctrine's wonky. Ask God where you're still a victim. Ask God where you're still offended. Ask God where you're still lazy. He'll talk. God talks because he, he's alive and he wants to help us. The quickest way to hear from God, two ways. Ask Lord, the Lord, show me where I'm wrong. Show me who to witness to. You'll hear from God before you go to sleep tonight. Just ask him, where am I wrong? Where am I sinful? Where are you irritated with me, Lord? And he'll show you quick. And then ask him, who can I witness to? And before, if you were to go to Walmart tonight, you'll find somebody to witness to. This is how God works. He cares about the lost and he cares about you. Since you're saved, he's cared about where you're messed up at. And all, it's all of us. We're all a little goofy and he wants to help us. All right? So did you get something out of that? All right. I didn't get to my points and that's fine. Five things we do to the Holy Spirit. Frustrate them, quench them, grieve them, resist them, and blaspheme them. That's a met lesson for another day. But there's always more going on behind the scenes. Why don't we stand to our feet? Let's pray in tongues for a little bit here. Father, thank you. You help us. You help us, Lord. We need your help, Father. We need your help, Father. We need your help. Father, you've given us authority beyond what Job knew. You've given us authority beyond what Daniel knew, and yet you use those mighty men to do great things. Yet their lives testify of more behind the scenes than we realize. Their lives, this record testifies of more, more going on behind the scenes than what we understand. Lord, we don't want to be carnal. We don't want to be Sunday morning church Christians. We want to be spiritual Christians. We want to be genuine, heartfelt Christians. We want to know what's going on. We want to be tuned in to what the Spirit of God is doing and saying. Help us, Lord, to hear from heaven. Help us, Lord, to be spiritual. Lord, as Reverend Danny taught us last week, our eyes are not wet enough. Our eyes are too dry. May we pray together as husband and wife. May we pray together with our children. May we learn to make intercession. May we realize we're going to have to learn this skill again now for what is coming. We're going to have to be able to intercede, changing the course of life praying protection, praying provision, praying for counsel, praying for direction, understanding that even angels can be thwarted by demons. Even angels sent to help us can be held up in time of need. 
Father, help us to pray. Help us to pray. May we pray until things change. May we pray until things change. May we learn to pray until things change. Father, may you be able to move us and may we be able to move you. May we be able to be moved by God and may our faith be able to move our God in time of need. Father, help us to be a co-labor, a true co-labor with you, obeying you and then asking you and then obeying you and then asking of you things. You command us to ask of you things. You command us to ask things in the name of Jesus. You, you said, whatsoever things you pray, believing you receive, you'll have them. You said to pray in your name and you would do it for us. You said, ask of you and you would give us. Father, may we be able to both move you in prayer and be moved by you in prayer. Speak to us, Lord, we'll obey you. Speak to us, Lord, we'll obey you. Speak to us, Lord, we'll obey you. And I pray that you would open all of our eyes to see what's going on in our lives that hinder us. May we be able to see it. May we be able to see that thing that has violated the hedge. May we be able to see that thing that's hindered us, the attitude. Maybe it's a familiar spirit. Maybe it's an old offense. Lord, you know all things, and we're asking you to reveal it to us. It's not your will that we be hindered, struggled, bound up. We're asking you to show us tonight. Show me where I'm wrong, Lord. Show me where I'm wrong in my marriage. Show me where I'm wrong in my parenting. Show me, Lord, where I'm wrong in my pastoring. Show me where I'm wrong in my doctrine. I want to know where I'm wrong so that I don't have to be that way anymore. Lord, open our eyes. Show us all where we are yet wrong. Show us all where our pride hinders us. Show us all where our tradition hinders us. Show us all, Lord, where our stubbornness hinders us. And may we see behind the curtain of the spirit realm when we need to so we can pray and be accurate and intercede and, and be on target for what you've called us to do. Let's pray in tongues here. Forobon kodushte. Hadeba kodushte. Goreba kadishte. Goroba kadishte. Goreba kadishte. Goroba kadishte. Goroba kadishte. Zoroba kadishte. Zoroba kadishte. Jesus, areba kodushto. Areba kadishte. Hare kodo 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 bala kadisha kada le kadushu ko. Tore kadishte. Tore kadishte. Tore kadishte. Tore kadishte. Tore ba kadishte. Tore ba kadishte. Jesus, you help us. Jesus, o kore ba baleva kushto. Zore ba kadisha gare ba baleva le ba baleva le ba kushto. Zore ba baleva le ba bala kadisha kede. Zore ba baleva le ba baleva le ba baleva kushto to. Zore ba baleva kushto le ba baleva kushto to. Sore baba la vola baba la vokushto la baba la vokushto. Gore baba kushto. Gore baba la vola baba kushto re baba. Gore baba la vola baba la vola baba la vola baba la vokushto la baba la vola boku. Sore baba la vola baba la vokushto la baba la voku. Gore baba le vokushu, gore baba le vokushu. Sore baba le vale baba le vale baba le vokushu. Ah, Lord, help us. Help our marriages. Help these husbands to be fervent. Help these fathers to be diligent. Help us to stay up late in prayer, to rise up early in prayer, to cover our family with the blood of Christ, with the prayer of our faith to intercede for our children, to lead our children, to lead them and disciple them and love them and nurture them and care for them and raise them up in the fear of the Lord. Help us as fathers and husbands to lead our homes, not expecting our wives to do it, not expecting our pastor to do it. May we recognize that their discipleship befalls to us. Lord, may we intercede for our children and grandchildren. Lord, may we be responsible for seeing our whole household come to Christ. May we intercede till it happens. May we pray for decades like the praying mamas of old. May we pray for decades till it happens. May we not faint or f fall away or fumble. May we have the faith of those old school praying grandmas who would intercede till that grandbaby came to Christ, till their life was saved and delivered. 
Father, may we not give up that level of faith, that level of intercession. Help us, Lord. Help these men not to be lazy. 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 Help us to use the authority you've given us in prayer. May we lead the way. May we not be distracted by our phones, our computers, our careers. May we realize our greatest legacy is our wives and our children and our grandchildren. May we rise up, get off our duff, and press in for the authority and for the destiny of our families. Forgive the American man for being so useless and lazy, chasing a career but losing his kids. Help us, Lord, to intercede. Ah, Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You're good to us. You're good to us. Father, thank you for always speaking to us about the safety and well-being of our children and our grandchildren. Speak to us as heads of home. Speak to us, Lord, so we can pray, intercede, and do something else in the natural. Thank you for loving our children more than us and, and bringing it to us so we can pray, make intercession, and steer life, steer the course of history, even for our families. We thank you, Father, for helping us tonight realize there's more behind the curtain than we've understood or seen. Help us find the balance so we're not spooky on one ditch or ignorant on the other. May we realize there's a lot more going on than really meets the eye. Thank you for helping us tonight. In Jesus' name. Pray this with me. Father, correct me. Show me where I am wrong. Show me my mistakes that I cannot see. Show me where I am in error. Show me someone to witness to. Show me how to pray. Put a burden of prayer on me, Lord, so that I will intercede and see your kingdom come. Forgive me, Lord, for my American laziness. I repent. I will be more spiritual and more disciplined in prayer and in Bible study. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well,